Welcome everyone. I'm going to call this uh, special council meeting Tuesday, March 6th to order. Are there any late items to add to the agenda? Great. Uh, seeing none, I need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Seconder? Second. All those in favor? Not opposed. Motion is carried. Uh, we are going into the 2012 budget options and I will turn this over to staff and uh, Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I'm going to start off with um, carrying on from where we left at the last budget meetings, which is uh, the 5.818% that you see at the top of uh, the first section. Excuse me, Laurie, are you referencing somewhere in the book or? Yeah. No, you, you had our last presentation, budget presentations, we talked about 5.18%. Okay, that was so we don't have a handout for this. The last PowerPoint presentation. So, it should be in the last section of your binder. I you, don't, you don't really need it. We're carrying on from there anyway. Okay. So we left off at 5.18. Everything we're going to talk about tonight is now is in the new PowerPoint presentation and in the worksheets that you have, and, on, and we'll go through those as part of the presentation. I just wanted to tie it into where we left off with our last discussion, which was at 5.18%, and then Council gave us directions to come back with addi two additional scenarios, which was approximately 4% and approximately 2.5. So I'm going to walk you through how we got to those proposals and, and where we are with that. So on. Just to a point of order for the chair. Uh, for members of the public, how would that work if they want to comment or provide input? How's that? Council, we, we have an agenda and there's public input at the end. The end? Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. We left the last meeting at 5.18%, uh, so, and we had our direction from, from council. So what we did is, as staff was we, we, we took the um, the budget that we had at 5.18% and, and closeted ourselves in a room and said, how are we going to get there? And the first thing we did is we went back and looked at um, our supplemental and our core budgets and said, is there anything that, that we could tighten up or is there anything that we missed in there that could help us get to where you're looking uh, for the budget uh, to be? So in our supplemental, we um, had to add something back, which didn't help us. Um, we have our roof repair at 860 lamps and that we have to do, so we added that back at $6,500. But what we did find um, for a supplemental reduction was we had an overlap in our finance training budget because one of our um, staff members was going to retire near the end of this year. She has since decided that she will not be retiring this year, so we took that expense out. Um, we just found that out today, so we made that adjustment. Um, also, there is over an overtime amount in the Recreation and Sports Centre budget of $43,000 uh, that uh, Scott indicated we could come out of the budget, so we took that out as well. Um, under core adjustments, uh, Parks and Rec also went back and, and went through all of their numbers and, and decided that they were comfortable uh, increasing revenue by $50,000 $50, and that it, that would be achievable in, in 2012. So we've added that back. We had core staffing adjustments. We have uh, Director of Financial Services, which is vacant right now. Uh, we had that in the budget at a step three. We have step uh, four steps in our salary rates for exempt staff and uh, should we go out and advertise and hire, we may very well have to pay at the top end of that. So we wanted to have that in the budget just in case. So that was an add back. Then we had a parks, our parks manager position, as you know, Andy is, is off right now on sick leave, but uh, should, should he come back this year, uh, we felt comfortable that it wouldn't be prior to the end of June. So we've adjusted that salary. It was in that a full year, and we know that that's not gonna happen at this point in time. So we adjusted that salary. And also for the recreation program coordinator, that, um, that recruitment is in the process of being finalized right now, and I think they're moving to, to interviews very soon. But that hiring won't happen uh, until, at le until at least the end of April would be effective. So we've adjusted that salary. It was in the budget at, at uh, a full year, so we were able to do that. So all of these adjustments that we were able to do really didn't affect service levels, didn't affect staffing. It was just 
going back and reviewing what we had in there and what um, was realistic. So instead of starting at the 5.18%, we're actually starting at 4.42. So I just wanted to, that was just from going through and correcting anything in the current budget. So, um, so 4.42. So from there, we... Lori, yeah. excuse me, just, uh, I'm gonna just see if there are any questions just in getting through this. And I just have one, and I apologize, probably because I wasn't here last time, but um, I have a question around the, the increasing the revenue of Parks and Rec, and just in terms of, Scott, if you can give us some sense of how that's gonna occur, because when I was going through the numbers, from last year and the projections uh, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, um, my recollection is that we didn't meet those targets last year in many of the areas. And so I'd just like to get a sense of, of uh, what your, your thoughts are in terms of gaining these revenues. Absolutely. Um, as we go through the year, our staff are quite diligent of doing quarterly reports. And we've adjusted business units uh, throughout, this, throughout the 2011 budget cycle actual operating cycle um, to identify areas where we know we're not going to hit targets because we've shifted either the market has shifted or our program focus has shifted so what we've been doing the fifty thousand dollars in increased revenue is not across the board it's very targeted on specific business units that we either have a very strong hold within the market and we're further exploring or areas that have extra focus where we've already seen revenue projections based on the fact that it's now the second week of march and we've taken revenue for January, February, we've seen where those attendance are, uh, are going, and we're quite comfortable adjusting those forecasts accordingly. So it's very strategic, it's not just 50,000 on the bottom line, it's hitting specific business units that we know we're going to exceed our current expectations when we set the budget projections in November of 2011. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions, Council? Seeing none, that's great, thanks. So, in actuality, like I said, in, in, rather than the 5.18% we thought we were starting at, we now uh, have a starting point of 4.42. So our, our first uh, target was approximately 4. And as you can see, we came up um, with a 3.61. So what we did here is um, we, we started at the 4.42. Our supplementary reduction that, that we're recommending is that local grants actually not we're not reducing local grants, we're just not increasing them over the previous year. We're, we're recommending that the amount for local grants is status quo with 2011. Um, our core adjustments, which are one-time adjustments, these are, uh, and you'll notice that the total there, um, 50, 60, and 70 thousand dollars, is 180 thousand dollars. And the philosophy for this uh, recommendation was that there was an early approval by council of $180,000 for Centennial, which is uh, obviously it was voted in favor of, so it's important for the community, but we didn't feel uh, that, it was, that we were comfortable reducing service levels or staffing um, to accommodate that $180,000, but we were comfortable with making some one-time adjustments to contributions that we make into our fund, some of our funds using some additional casino funds, which we have available for this year, and I'll, I'll show you the balance in all of those funds at the end, that they still remain healthy, even with these uh, recommendations. The con contingency account, um, we consistently uh, put in our budget a $250,000 contingency, and that contingency is specifically for items that come up throughout the year that we haven't budgeted for, and it's basically a discretionary account for council to approve additional expenditures. So rather than carrying it at $250,000, we're comfortable reducing that to $200,000. Historically, the highest um, amount in the time that I've been here um, in eight years that we've used of the $250,000 was $117,000. So I'm more than comfortable with the $200,000 in contingency. So we thought that, um, um, was a reasonable way to get to our, our target of approximately 4%. Is there any questions on that? Nope. Thanks very much. So our next target was approximately 2.5%. And is that on? 
put something in the mouth it, or do you want to wait for them? Um, actually, if we could go back to the previous one. Thank you. Um, so through the chair to um, Ms. Hurst. So one of the issues that we've had in the past is around um, our policing costs. So how, um, just trying to figure out where that might, how this, where this works into this, into this budget. Is it paying what we have been asked to or still reducing to what we had in the past? Could you just, I'm just trying to figure out in my mind how that might work, because that's our, our largest cost. The policing costs that are in the budget have been adjusted for the officers that we um, uh, have um, direction from the solicitor's and general's office that we weren't responsible for paying for. That happened, I believe, initially in 2010. So we've adjusted the current um, uh, request by that. We've also adjusted for our disagreement in how the funding formula is allocated based on the assessed values. We've adjusted using out what we believe it is the fair assessment. So those costs are in there, but adjusted for those two items. And that's the only change? Yes. Any other questions? Well, through the chair. Oh, sorry. If I could pick up then on the policing cost. Should we not be successful in terms of you know, what we believe is the right responsible number? What then is the other number? What is the amount that we adjusted the yes. policing for? Um, I believe that was in my first presentation. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, Mary, do you recall what the number was for this year? Uh, I the adjusted number is $389,000, and I believe if we were to adjust it, um, it's probably going to be over 400000 if we were to adjust it based on assessments um, uh, we and um, to add the community resource office. To increase here for police services budget adjusted by for two community resource officer salaries from washer and formula based on actual assessments. Um, I don't uh, the, the increase in policing that is in the budget is three hundred and eighty nine thousand. But I believe what you're asking for is what is the portion that we didn't put into the yes, budget. Yes. And I don't have that number off the top of my head. I believe it was in the neighborhood of two hundred thousand, but I can double check. So approximately one percent. Yeah. 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 Remember, one percent is uh, two hundred twenty-eight thousand based on the two thousand eleven act. But that is a, a guesstimate. But I will firm that number. Okay. Well, yeah. That helps. Um, so that leads me into one further question, not having been present, and again I apologize. Uh, has council accepted and approved at this point the, the police budget as presented, or this is just now please, still within discussion? Police budget is within our budget and gets approved at the same time our budget gets approved. Yes, and so if we want to have discussions about how we make changes to that, tonight is the night to do that? Yes. When we go through the supplemental those amounts, uh, we can discuss those amounts. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to highlight it. Just okay. Make sure we didn't lose it. And any further questions? Okay. So our next scenario that uh, council gave us direction was approximately 2.5 percent, and as you can see, we've come in at 2.56 percent. Um, what we did here to bring uh, this down from 3.61 to 2.56 was. We will go through this in detail later, but we have staffing or supplemental staffing requests in the budget this year, amounting to eighty thousand dollars. We we are recommending that under the two point five six um, scenario that those staffing requests um, are not approved. And then we have three public works projects that would not happen under this scenario. We would not do a road condition evaluation. We not have a library for engineering reports and we not, would not have additional storage for plans. So, and in addition to that, so I just, I'll, I'll go back to the staffing request. Um, I think what I need to say here is that if those staffing requests, and we'll go into this further later on, are, are not approved, then we will 
have a really hard time meeting council's strategic priorities because those staffing requests are really tied to uh, the direction that council's given us under strategic priorities. Um, the other item that we put in here was an appropriation of 2011 surplus. The reason we didn't include this in the first scenario or the second scenario is because we are not 100% sure what the surplus for 2011 will be. So um, we put this in, I put this in only because, again, historically, we have had um, a surplus of $100,000 plus in the years that I've been here. But we haven't finished our year end yet. Our audit isn't complete and won't be complete until the end of March, beginning of April. Uh, so we don't have, I don't have 100% confidence in the surplus number. So the 2.56% scenario is not the one that staff is recommending. We would um, uh, recommend the 3.61% tax increase. Um, having said that, we were sitting and discussing, looking at the 3.61% scenario and knowing that obviously council would want to get lower than that if possible. And then we were looking at the 2.56% um, tax increase and thinking, you know, what could we do to to further decrease the 3.61, which uh, 3.61% 3, 3 tax increase um, is what staff would recommend because it allows us to do all the projects uh, that we have in the budget. It allows us not to de decrease service levels or staffing levels, and um, it still keeps us relatively financially healthy. But if I take a, if we take a combination of the 2.56% and the 3.61, we thought there is a relative <coughs> degree of confidence with the $100,000 surplus. And if staff were making a recommendation, this is the recommendation that we would be making, which is that the 3.61%, that the tax increase or the tax rates be developed based on the 3.61%. But as we get closer to the end of the March, if we confirm up the surplus numbers, we bring that surplus into 2012 to decrease the 3.61 as much as possible. Um, if, if, we, if we had the $100,000 surplus, that would reduce it to a 3.17% tax increase. Thank you. Uh, questions? Councilor Morrison? Just some clarification on the staffing levels, the approximate $80,000. Is that uh, proposing an increase of hours of current staff, or is that proposing hiring of, of brand new uh, staff? Uh, or a combination of them. all of the above. All of the, okay. That's. We'll, we'll go, we have a, an actual separate worksheet for that. We'll go through it okay. in, in detail, line by line. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one. If you can go back to the last slide, please. So, when we're looking at supplemental reductions, there are a number of supplemental items. Uh, and so, staff have chosen these. Uh, but, um, it's my understanding that under Public Works, we have $70,000 supplemental for speed humps, for example. So in terms of what Council is looking at, uh, although these are the uh, choices that staff have made, Council can look through and choose which of the supplemental items they may want to use to reduce those Amounts. It's, it, it's really up to council at this point to make decisions strategically, short term, long term within those supplementals and how we go forward. Absolutely. So there's, there is um, room to maneuver different than the scenarios presented, I guess is what I wanted to uh, make sure that you were aware of. These are simply staff's recommendation based on the direction that council gave us. Yeah. But then uh, on top of this, you're absolutely right, when we go through the supplemental and capital, if you add thing, add projects or items back in, it will increase these, and if you delete or decrease items, it will decrease uh, these tax increases. Well. And that's at your, it's at your discretion as we go through the worksheet. Yes, but just for example, uh, I, and I use the speed bumps because I know the number. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to go through these supplementals individually so that we have that? Okay. So, uh, because, you know, the, the road condition evaluation, uh, to 
from, from discussion I, uh, I understand is a proactive way of moving forward in terms of re resolving long-term infrastructure problems. Uh, and, and so if I'm looking at that versus speed hubs, I can switch one in for the other, then we save 20,000 extra dollars there and that helps to juggle this around, right? So it's not that I'm adding more on, therefore reducing, I can mix and match, mm -hmm. or we can as a group. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Councillor Hundley. Um, thank you. Through the chair to uh, Ms. Hurst. I wondered if you could give us a general um, understanding of how utilities have changed. So we know that in our own homes, the cost of oil and gasoline for our vehicles and electricity and so on has increased. And I wondered how that's affected the municipality. Um, so you're talking about what we discussed at the last meeting with other economic indicators of, or? Uh, you could do it in, in the context of economic indicators, yes. Right. But I'm just thinking that I know that there has to be some mm -hmm. impacts to the municipal budget as well as our own home budget. So I was curious as to what those might be or if, if right. you had a chance to actually um, analyze those. We did actually look at those. I looked at uh, I looked at both of those. I looked at some other uh, economic indicators and did some research. I actually I didn't hand it out yet, but there was also a request at the last budget meeting to do um, uh, to provide a, a spreadsheet. Although the information is a bit dated on population versus diff costs of different um, um, services, and I've done that. Um, we had a we had a discussion uh, at the staff level uh, in regard to utilities and and uh, fuels and, and those sorts of things, and you guys can jump in any time, but our initial discussion was um, that we didn't see uh, a large increase in any of those areas in, in our municipal budget. Um, so it wasn't significant enough to pull it out and, and, and examine it. We didn't, we didn't have a lot of that. As you know, um, in the rec center, in the sports center, there was a lot of work done to take advantage of energy savings and those sorts of things. So I think we're seeing the results of, of that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morrison? Um, if we could just go back to the contingency fund issue. Oh, sure. uh, $250,000 and then having that right. increase significantly. And, and as a council, I, or as a councillor, I sort of see contingency funds as as our friend, and uh, I get very nervous when we start talking about reducing them. And, and I do, I understand your point based on past uh, measurements or past practices that it hasn't really been needed. I always get nervous though that the Murphy's Law rule would be the year that you do reduce it significantly is the year that somehow you definitely need that fund. And, and that's why it's there, just because it's so unpredictable. And you've been looking at surplus not being certain yet at 100,000. And I wonder, is there a a best practice rule for municipal budgets that there, that a, a contingency fund should be a set percentage, or is it? I, I know there's other municipalities within the same region that have gotten themselves into a lot of trouble, mm -hmm. um, you know, without naming municipalities. And this community has been known quite uh, to have quite a good reputation in, in, in planning for a rainy day type situation. Right. So, yeah. Uh, there was a multitude of questions in there, so I'll yeah. try to address them all. What, what's the rule on, on There is no rule on a contingency fund. What there is is a rule on your overall budget, which is you have, um, in combination with contingency, you have uh, surplus contingency and uh, reserve funds that are available to you uh, in the amount of, I believe, Mary, it's 1% of, uh, of, your, of your overall budget. And we have that ruling from, and we have got that advice from KPMG a couple of years ago. Um, with our, with your ability to access uh, reserve funds and to access any surplus and to access your contingency, we are well above that percentage. Reducing your contingency um, in your budget doesn't mean that you still don't have access to those funds. It just means having to come back to council and do a resolution rather than it being available as part of the budget. Thank you. Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A question around, uh, and just exploring opportunity. We 
council supported a request from the Centennial uh, Committee, approximately $180,000. Right. Now, that was the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. They were still very active in seeking grant monies and other opportunities, sponsorships, etc. Right. so that that amount may, may, may in fact be significantly decreased. Right. Is there any update on that at this point? Any feedback? Or any of the grants been approved that, that we know of? Or are we still at the place where we're waiting to hear? You're looking to me to answer that. Well, if anybody has any information, or are we still at that raw number of 182? Uh, we're still at the raw number of 182 that I'm aware of. And I'm, I am by no means up to date, except that I had a meeting today that suggested that that number will change. That's all I can say in terms of it's not, it's not signed and on, the, on the line. There is an opportunity there. And it was based on the presentation where the committee felt very positive that that number would not be necessary. So I'm just that'll impact uh, on the, the bottom line at the end of the day in a good way. The, the, the one thing that I have to say that our staff do well is they budget very conservatively, which is why we are in the great state that we are in. With all the variables that we have, including PILT, et cetera, and so we never we never count our eggs until they're until they're actually in the basket. Uh, and and so yes, we can say that. But what we, you know, I think what staff are saying is, you know, with what, all that we've got right now, um, this is what we're getting. Centennial Committee, I know, is is um, um, very uh, hopeful of of receiving funds. And as I say, I got a positive indication today. Yeah. And again, you know, just supplemental. In terms of what I'm thinking about is that if there were some projects or positions that you know we weren't able to support at this time, does not mean, in fact, that in a couple of months from now, if the financial picture was to change, that we could come back as a council and say, "Yeah, you know that position that you need." We're now able to move forward. Anyway, it was just the. I think a, a positive thing that is uh, potential, and I understand it's, it's simply potential. Do you want to comment to that? Um, yeah, a couple of comments. So on, on the issue of being conservative, um, accountants are notoriously conservative, and that's what this um, recommendation incorporates. Pulling or reducing these other one-time um, items by the exact amount of the centennial is a very conservative budget. And as you say, if the, if the centennial budget turns out to not be a net cost of 180,000, you could, for instance, reduce the amount of casino funds that you bring in to the budget, or you could reduce, or you could increase the amount of money that you put into your capital projects reserve fund. Any of these three numbers that amounts to that 180,000 could be adjusted to reflect whatever cost ends up being um, incurred by Centennial. Thank you. Councillor Hunley. Thank you, Chair. Through you to Mr. Miller. I wondered if you could provide some background for us regarding the sewage, um, not sewage treatment, but our sewer pipes within the municipality and how the um, what the term is now? Um, how the uh, the upgrades to those um, or improving the condition of those sewer pipes is coming along, and how this it's reflected into our current budget as we as we see it here at three point six one. Your worship, to the councillor, um, as you know, we undertook a program of relining in the early 2000s where I believe if I remember the number correctly approximately half of our pipes will be lined. Um, since that time we have not countered the lines. Uh, so to tell you what the condition is I really can't tell you. Well I, I can probably tell you we probably haven't experienced any breaks on those lines yet. But to what the condition of the, the main lines are I would be quoting the number from 2000 which is the change to the line. 
as we move into future budget years, um, I will be looking to institute a program on a, probably on a 10 year cycle to camera our lines at least every once 10 years to give us a, a snapshot of what the system looks like. Thank you. And in terms of the, um, the, the crossing of the lines between um, sewer and stormwater and, and that work, uh, could you comment on that? That is uh, an ongoing program. Uh, there is a budget request um, in this year's budget as well, uh, which we will come across later as we go through, I believe it's in the capital project, uh, in the capital side rather than the supplementary. So you, you will be seeing it come up again. Thank you. I think we're ready to roll. Okay, so I, uh, actually Jeff just reminded me of a clarification that I should make too, and I know you were only using the speed humps as an example, uh -huh. but just so that everybody's under the same understanding, the $70,000 for speed humps is in the budget, but it's not in supplemental, it's in capital. It does not have a tax uh, impact. We have funded it from the capital projects reserve fund. So um, I just wanted, so you can trade out other things for the 50,000, but the 70,000 wouldn't result in any impact to the tax increases that I've shown you. I think it's listed under supplemental. It's under supplemental under capital. capital. Oh, under capital. Request. Under capital, mm -hmm. thank you very yes. much. And funded from a reserve fund. So, pardon me, yes. Councillor. And this question, it may be better to come in later, but I hold on. Picking up on the, uh, the traffic calming uh, issue, as it was suggested, uh, and we heard loud and clear last night from residents, uh, it, it's not necessarily speed tables or speed hubs that are required, and I'm wondering if uh, Public Works Engineering has had a chance to consider options to that, or is that something that will be con considered going forward? Your Worship, to the Councillor, I think that's where I'm going to look at direction from Council. If you deny the speed humps through the Capital Project Reserve and give direction that you would want to undertake that work, I would come back with you for a cost um, if I had to go external or if, if I could do it internally um, and let you know what the associated cost would be and then get permission to move forward with it. So if I could just follow up on that. So I think what the question is, is are there options to speed tables? So is there something else where that 70000 could be spent to achieve the desired outcome, which is to eliminate speeding? Uh, you worship to the council that there probably are other options. Um, what they are, I couldn't tell you right off the bat without further research. Is that something that will be undertaken, uh, that research, so it's not just simply speed tables, but there is another opportunity? I'm just wondering if that's within I would say that would be a direction the council would uh, give me to what uh, direction you want to take that project. Thank you. So uh, just in terms of clarifying, it, right now it's currently in the budget at 70000 which we have given staff indication that um, the report that was presented and what the options were uh, we want to put into this budget. If we do not approve this budget with that amount, then we can provide the direction for the staff to go back and look at alternative options. Well, I think what I'm asking is, I support funding to address the speeding issue on Old Squire Road. Yeah. I just want to make sure that what we do is the best solution. So it may be we need to tell us, ask staff for an option within the dollar amount that may not necessarily require speed tables, and yet our objective of eliminating speeding would be accomplished. Yes, and, and I guess what I'm trying to do is clarify that, that right now we're within budget discussions, 
we haven't given staff that direction, but that's all an alternative. Right now, within the budget, what we're doing is uh, approving and moving forward with whatever we've got or that funding and how it's been presented. We can change that direction later. Am I correct? When we go through the, the capital uh, budget or the capital request line by line, when we get to that item, you can give that direction to staff and we'll follow through on it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm not skipping. I've done those ones. So in all of the scenarios that I've given, we have not altered the capital um, projects. So under 4.42, 3.61, and 2.56, the capital requests and the recommendations from staff remain the same. All of these capital projects, uh, what I've done is I've, I've um, put all the, the, the total amounts, and we'll go through these, these are on, on your worksheets. All of these capital projects will, are contained in this budget and in, under all three tax increase scenarios. So as you can see, we have $7.3 million in capital projects that are being funded from these different reserve funds, grants, community works fund, casino, and prior year projects that were carried forward that were approved for funding last year that didn't get completed, but we brought them forward to this year. In addition to that, we actually have in this budget a total of seven point, almost $7.6 million in capital projects that we would be completing this year under each of those uh, tax increase scenarios. Even under the 2.56% scenario, we would still be doing these capital projects. Councilor Hunter, please. Thank you. Um, to the Chair, Ms. Hurst. So, could you please confirm that the amount that would be going into the capital funds <coughs> as replacement, it is also included in our budgets. It's in your core budget. Okay, thank you. You're talking about the transfer they put in there for retired debt payments, the amount that we contribute to the capital yes. project reserve fund? Yes, yes that's, and that's taken into account in the final balances that I'll be showing you shortly. For that, but it hasn't altered those? No, okay. thank you. Other, th other than the one under, um, under scenario of 3.61, we were reducing that contribution by $60,000. That is the only adjustment to that amount. Um, and that's, that's also reflected in 2.56. Yes. yes, yes. So $7.5 million in capital projects in the 2012 budget. Here are our projected reserve fund and account balances. Uh, I've highlighted uh, 2012. These are the projected balances uh, that would be, that are projected to be there December 31st, 2012, after we complete all of the projects requested under the budget. So um, we have a total of, we would have a total of $2.6 million from our statutory reserve funds and then additional uh, monies left in casino revenue and community works funding. And that takes into account completing the $7.5 million worth of capital projects and um, our core budgets and supplemental requests. Uh, any questions on those? Casino revenue. Uh, we have traditionally slotted that toward uh, uh, bringing down the debt on the um, recreation center. We still do. So this is over and above yes. that. Thank you. And it's over and above bringing an additional seventy thousand dollars in uh, to help us get to the three point six one percent tax increase and um, funding funding a couple of other projects as well. Thank you. And do we do traditionally have money left over in the casino fund? Yes. Uh, at about this level? About this level. Thank you. So, um, you can't see my, the colors very well on, on the overhead, but um, I tried to color code this page uh, to match your worksheets. 
what we've done is the 4.42% uh, tax increase is done in, in black lettering on your worksheets. Anything that we've uh, taken out of the supplemental requests or the capital requests is done in red on your on your worksheets, and then anything that we took out under the 2.56% tax increase is done in blue on your worksheets, and those are all totaled on your worksheets as we go through. So it'll show you on the worksheets if it's in black and recommended by staff, then it's included in the 4.42%. If it's if there's something in red subtracting, that means it comes out under the 3.61, and if it's in blue, it comes out under the 3.61 and the 2.56. Councillor Hutchins. Through the chair, a question for staff. Very general question, but I'm hoping it helps us over the long term. So we've just been through a significant strategic planning process, and we've identified the priorities. And I'm wanting to ensure that whichever option we choose, built into the option, is support for those strategic priorities. Uh, by way of example, when we talk about uh, economic development, and I, I know Mr. Brown is on site, and uh, it will be out and about generating some significant revenues through economic development. Uh, I'm sure it's built into your performance contract. Yeah. So that's on the strategic plan. It's called performance measurement. That, uh, I have to develop that yet, but I'll make sure it's included on well, thank you. Mr. Brown's. Yeah. That then <laughs> controlling the deer. So, yeah. <laughs> so if you understand what I'm, what I'm looking for is just to make sure that in fact we are coordinated and connected back to our strategic priorities within the options presented. And I, know I can't, we can't get into the detail, but generally. Generally, uh, the strategic priorities are covered under the 4.42 and the 3.61. The strategic, strategic priorities um, will be partially covered under the 2.56, but not, um, not completely covered. We need those additional staffing requests in order to provide that support to get there. So. That's very helpful, thank you. So I'm going to leave that last, the last slide up on the screen. As you can see, under 4.42% total supplemental, supplemental operating requests are 1,044,000. That ties into the spreadsheets, the worksheets that we have, the final numbers at the end. The supplemental staffing, there's another worksheet with the $80,000 detailed on it, and there's supplemental capital. Out of the capital, only 66490 is coming from operating. The rest is coming from reserve funds, grants, donations, um, other funding sources that don't impact the tax increase. As you can see, under the 3.61%, we've reduced supplemental operating requests to, uh, very slightly down to 1039000 As you recall, on the summary sheets, we offset that and managed to get that tax reduction, the one-time reductions in other areas than supplemental requests. And under 2.56, the supplemental requests are 979,000 and the capital is 66,490. And so all of these numbers tie into those worksheets that you have. And what we will do um, now is, now that you've been given the overview of where we're at and what the staff recommendation was, we um, would like to start with the um, supplemental requests, and, and that's the one that has, uh, it's the, I think the lar largest package that you have. Um, the one that starts uh, general government, legislative membership fees, that's, that's the spreadsheet that we'd like to start, yeah. We've got, like to start with that spreadsheet, and what we'll do is uh, each of uh, the directors or managers responsible for each of those sections will give you a general overview. You can ask questions and have discussion um, as we go through. If you want to flag, I'm just going from what, the way we've done this in previous years, if you want to flag something for discussion to come back to it later, we can do that. Um, just ask us and we'll flag it as staff and we'll, we'll bring it back to you at the end. If you want to make uh, give directions to staff as soon as you go over the items, you can do that. Um, but we'll go through all of this. Uh, I don't know how long it will 
it will take tonight. We may only get through the supplemental. We may get through all of it tonight. I, I, I don't know. It depends on how the discussion goes. Thank you. Um, uh, I certainly would prefer that we, as we go through it, we identify these things. What I find is when you get to the end of a list, you, you forget some things. So that's how I'm going to approach it. So uh, if council's uh, okay with that process, we will have each of the people responsible for these areas go through them in, uh, as a general overview. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. So um, we'll start with Anya for legislative uh, services. Okay, so there are four items included in this. Uh, the first two are membership fees. Uh, Tourism Victoria um, was Previously, it's not a new amount, it's just the moving it over uh, here. It used to be covered as a local grant, and um, it was felt that it's more appropriate as a membership fee, so it's just a transfer from one department to another. The amount is the same, I believe. Uh, Treaty Advisory Committee, there is a, uh, a core amount that we have been uh, paying each year, and um, it's thought that uh, this needs to be increased uh, by the amount of $3,500 this year. Um, so that brings the total budget for that item to $5,000. And that was, I believe, previously brought to council and, and, and looked at, so. uh, The meeting expenses, um, this includes things like the uh, orientation, council orientation sessions, where we had to bring in a uh, facilitator, the strategic planning sessions, um, uh, meal expenses for uh, meetings. Uh, we had not budgeted sufficiently in the past, and it's uh, felt that we needed to this to cover all of those uh, meeting expenses. And the uh, uh, council calendar and email system has a monthly charge uh, included in uh, maintaining that, uh, that system online for council. So this is the uh, uh, monthly charge uh, over the year, which is an increase from last year. Those are the ones that are covered in the council legislative budget. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hundleby. Thank you. Um, my memory is failing me here. And so I'm just wanting some uh, clarification. So for Tourism Victoria, um, my recollection with the previous um, local grants was that it was a, a, an amount that was identified as what we felt that we could afford within our local grants budget, but it, the membership fee was actually higher. Um, so I wondered if you could just clarify that it is the membership fee that had been requested and not just the amount that had been pulled out of local grants. This, this is a combination of both. This, this is the membership fees. Okay, so as Tourism Victoria yes. invoices, this is what they've requested this as a membership fee? Requested. Thank you. To follow on that, if we've put it in this part of the budget, have we reduced the local grants in the same fashion? Uh, no, we haven't because the local grants is done by an amount, not but not specific to grants. Uh, the local grants is allocated an amount, and then how they distribute it is up to them. So we didn't reduce it by that amount. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Thanks very much. The next section is the administration. Uh, the amounts that are excuse me, Anya. Um, sorry, I also have questions tonight. Um, I'm wondering whether um, it would be an important item for council to actually review the use of the calendar and email system to know that it's doing what we wanted it to do. Is that going to happen or is this going to be an anecdotal? It seemed to me it would be important for us to review that. See if we wanted any improvements or if it's doing what we want it to do. I'm not sure how the <coughs> question fits into the budget amount, I guess is where, I, can you clarify? I guess my question is, you know, do we really need to spend the money still or not? And so if we're all happy with it and we don't want to see any changes, then that would be fine. But if we, we did want to see some changes, we wanted something more or less or whatever, then that might change. So 
Uh, staff, can you clarify what the uh, $1,500 cost is? $1,500 is the uh, annual annualized cost of the internet fees uh, to keep that supported uh, for the year. I would expect um, that we would have ongoing discussion about whether that system is working or not. I, um, and, and we would especially have it when we do our quarterly reports um, to council. Um, I think that would be the appropriate place to have those. And if there's improvements that need, need to be made, I, I would expect this is $1,500 is a small cost for this. The large cost was when we implemented it last year. I would hope that we wouldn't do away with the system, but if there was improvements that we needed, but that we would look at making those. And we can certainly have those discussions. We should have those discussions because it is a new system, so we want to have that dialogue on whether it's it's working well or can be improved. I, I imagine our, our uh, I, it's my opinion that there are parts of that system that we aren't utilizing at this point because we're just getting up and running on it. Thank you. Councilor Hodgins. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Pick up on the conversation. I, for one, am extremely pleased with the system. I find it very effective, very useful, great communications tool. And if there are some options to enhance our use of the tool or the tool itself, I'm all in favor. I think communications is extremely important, and the system, from my perspective, uh, is doing the job. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I'll just add my two cents. I think this, it's too young to really know, and $1,500 is $1,500. So uh, um, I think it, it, in support of it, we analyze it as we go forward, as staff have suggested. Thank you. Okay, moving on to administration. There are five items here. Uh, the first one is um, uh, just uh, increasing the amount for overtime for staff. Uh, we do have uh, several staff members that have to attend uh, evening council or committee meetings for minute taking uh, staff liaison. Um, we haven't been budgeting sufficiently for overtime, and so this is um, an, an increase to the, uh, the budget. Uh, likewise, the pay for uh, acting CAO. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything else about that, Lori. They, they actually expect to get paid when I'm not here to do my job. Councilor Shane, might you have uh, a question? Yes, Your Worship, for you to staff. Um, I'm a little concerned about that $7,000 uh, for acting pay. I, I just, given what the, the actual salaries are, I find it a little hard to see paying extra money. I'm just having some difficulty with that. Thank you. Councilor Morrison? Um, just following up. Is that a discretionary amount of money? Is that something that we are contractually obligated to do with each of the individual contracts of our directors? Um, I kind of share the view that, you know, part of being a director, part of being a management is that part of your overall pay is for certain times of the year for very temporary periods. You would act in a more senior capacity, but without, you know, the compensation that goes along with it because you're not the permanent person responsible. The buck doesn't stop with you permanently. You're just doing it on a substitutional basis. And the reason why you have higher pay for the higher position is because that CEO position is continuously responsible for everything, not just on a temporary basis. But sorry, I just I'll go straight to my back to my question. Is it is it something we have some discretionary control? Over? We have uh, exempt officers and employees bylaw and policy that stipulates uh, that when someone's acting in a higher position, they get a 5% uh, increase in their pay for doing that, those acting duties. But just, just sort of go back to my question, that's not in their contract, it's a bylaw, is that right? It, it, it's a bylaw and a policy. And not in the contract, right. individual contract. Right. So if council took this $7,000 out, we just have to basically change that bylaw. Right. Councillor Hodgins. Uh, thank you, through the chair. I support the need for appropriate compensation for the responsibilities that one assumes. I'm wondering within that bylaw, and I played on into a detailed discussion this evening, but within that bylaw, is that uh, for an identified time? For example, you know, if you're away for a day uh, and someone's acting, or if you're 
fact on vacation for a week. Is there any uh, rules around that? It's for a week or longer. Oh, thank you. Councilor Morrison. Just to draw a comparison here, um, each one of the council members does acting mayor duties two months of the year. Their pay does not change in those two months. So, you know, uh, just in terms of consistency. And I want to be very clear that uh, we have very good directors, excellent directors. And as Councilor Schoenbein said, we do pay them decent salaries for the jobs that they do. I see part of that job also being a temporary CEO as required. Um, but just like we'd be temporary mayors as required without compensation. Councilor, that is within Council's discretion to uh, put that forward as well within that policy. Um, so, um, there, can you perhaps um, give us a bit more background as to why this is increased? Is it because of the increase that Council uh, um, passed in the last little while that has increased this amount? It's, it's um, mostly to do with the, with the pay increases in the council. Yeah. 2011, and then other uh, times it's a pay that for 2000, and other uh, will be for 2012 as well. Yeah, so it's it's within uh, the rules that we, or the policies we've passed already. Thank you. Okay, any further questions on that? Seeing none, um, we'll move on. Okay, the next item is for the Breckers Management Program, which has been um, identified as one of Council's strategic priorities. So this allows us to um, have a bit of consulting, some um, uh, upgrades to our software possibly, and, and purchasing some materials to try to get that um, program started. So it's, uh, it's just a, a start of that program. We're not quite um, clear on the total extent of what is required. But that'll uh, get us started for this year at least. Uh, the next two items for our, are for our communications uh, coordinator. One is uh, social media staff training, which again is important um, uh, these days to uh, bring staff up to uh, speed on that. And uh, uh, computer software for communications as well has been identified as being required in order to, um, um, to make sure that we have up-to-date uh, <coughs> communications um, available to us. Questions, Council? Councillor Hundleby and then Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Chair. And the question is, are these all um, supplemental items that are will roll over into core, or are these one-time um, supplemental requests? If, if the request is a core, you'll see it uh, shown repeated in the middle column. If it's not repeated in the middle column, it's a one-time cost. Thank you for the question. Thank you, and I have Councillor Hodgins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question, I'm assuming, comes under this area of responsibility. And we've talked about the need to enhance or improve the communications within uh, this room proper. So, the, the, the communications for mayor and council, the communications for the public as they address mayor and council, etc. Is that something that would need to be added again, or is that being contemplated overall in the, in the budget for 2012? Communications in the sense that you're talking with improvements to this room would be under capital rather than supplemental budget. Um, and I'm not sure if they're there, but I can, I, I'll, I can check. And see. We can, yeah, no, we can. I think there, there was something under I, the IT section for do upgrade, yeah, upgrade council chambers, audio visual equipment, and to the council chamber. So that's what I've talked about. Thank you. Councillor Morrison. Um, we just go to the, sorry, the social media line item, $1,700. That's just to look for some consistency. I know with Parks and Recreation, we had a very successful uh, launch of social media. And I'm wondering, did they spend $1,700 training to do that? That might be more appropriate question for the director of Parks and Rec. But. This is the amount that I guess uh, Richie Morrison has checked into opportunities out there. And this is the amount that he has told me that the training course would require for the, the one that he is interested okay. in, in taking. And fair enough. And, but I, I guess what I'm getting at is I know 
organizations, including perhaps Parks and Rec, within our own organization, have managed to be very successful very quickly with social media. And it's not the wonders of social media is it doesn't really require a lot of professional training. It certainly is it does require that if you want to take it to a different level, but but just to implement it, it's you know, young children are doing it every day. <laughs> so it's not a difficult, complex uh, training requirement to, to start a Twitter account or a, maintain a Twitter account or a Facebook page. And, and I, so I'm just, what I'm trying to be very cautious here, if we're going to approve $1,700, and all we're going to get out of it is something we can learn, our staff can learn quite quickly on their own um, just by playing around with social media. Just putting that cautionary note out. And as I say, I use the example of Parks and Rec. As far as I know, they don't have any uh, dedicated social media coordinators trained or whatever in social media. They just did it, and they did a great job of it. Fantastic job, of course. I have to say I attended social media camp with our uh, uh, Parks and Rec staff, so I know that we've spent money on their training. That was my question. Now, uh, any further questions in this area? Councillor Shinbein, did you have something further? Uh, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, with reference back to the uh, uh, pay for the uh, acting CAO, uh, I would like to uh, propose, or I'm not sure of the procedure, a uh, motion that uh, at the moment that be removed from the budget uh, pending review of the current bylaw that we have out on that. I'm not sure of the procedure. I think at this point, what I would suggest is that we flag it to, to come back to within the mix of everything, unless you're really feeling strongly about at this time. It may not be able to come back into the budget in the time frame that we need to review that bylaw. That would be my worry. And if it's required after we review that, then we might be in trouble. So. Uh, I would suggest that we flag it at this point uh, and uh, we can always revisit again but even to have a look at the bylaw might be the best way to start as opposed to taking it out completely before uh, and not have the option. Does that make sense what I've said? I can agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll add a flag beside that so that uh, Council can uh, review that bylaw and have an understanding of it. Uh, <laughs> Councillor McKay. Thank you. Through staff, um, social media staff training comes uh, down $1,700. that from uh, courses that Rich is going to attend outside of yes. his hours of work? Yes. Okay, so that's programs that we're going to buy for him to upgrade. Is that correct? No, computer software for communications is software that we're going to buy. Training is simply going to training sessions. Yeah. Okay. And I noticed he didn't even put his camera in there that he desperately needs. Yeah. <laughs> Having heard that conversation. Well done, Richie, for narrowing it down. Um, I think we're, everybody okay now on this one? Okay, so we'll move on to finance. Okay, so finance, there's, there's not too much here. The overlap for payroll has since been not recommended by the staff. That retirement will not be happening. Uh, legal services for appeal to appeal. We have uh, appeal to appeal from previous, uh, previous year that's outstanding. We're also going to be making a second uh, pill to pill for 2011, and we're just in the process of filing that now. We are going to have legal fees associated with that, so we need to put that in the budget. Um, staff training courses in accordance with education policy. We do have an education policy uh, that if the staff members are taking courses that are relevant to their work, uh, that we um, we pay a certain percentage of that. We have a, a couple of members of the finance department who are taking uh, their CGA courses and such, so we've um, they put in a request for that that we've included in the budget. 
Council, any questions? Thank you. Grants to organizations, uh, uh, intermissible social services submit their requests uh, each year. There's an increase requested uh, for that. Um, and local grants of 36, 44, um, that is the, those are the increases that we don't, aren't recommending under the 3.61% tax increase, the, the 4,248, 4, you'll see it in the red. We've taken that out under that scenario. It is included in the 4.42% tax increase. And so that's just the increase in accordance, the 36.44 is increase in, in accordance with our policy, which is to increase local grants each year by the previous year's average tax increase. Thank you. Councillor uh, Brain. Um, so the grants for, through you to staff, so the grants for intermunicipal social services, so we have a choice as to how much we pay for those. I kind of thought they were man, not mandated, but. No, no, they're not actually. They come to local, the local grant committee the same as all the other local grants. I think there's been a sense that they're, they're less flexible than others because they're for different type organizations. Yeah. So there is some more flexibility in there than? There is flexibility. You don't have to approve the increases when it comes to the local grant. Now, just it, it says that it's not recommended by staff. We're yeah, we're recommending that we don't do increases to either of those. Okay, things. so that's what that right. just double check. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. To follow on with that, and I'll come to you, Councillor Hunter. Um, in the discussions that we have had over the last year, uh, when we've uh, gone out to the public and and uh, asked them to give us their thoughts around, um, you know, tax increases versus services uh, and, and those sorts of discussions. Local grants comes up time and time again in terms of whether um, that is an area we should be looking at in terms of, um, you know, uh, do, we, do we continue to fund to the level that we are doing? And certainly, uh, from from what we heard, um, I I feel that that is an area that I would like to look at in terms of uh, recognizing the hardship of reducing those. Uh, I think that uh, clearly we uh, have to look at all areas, and uh, certainly I support not increasing it. But I also see that there's an opportunity to uh, decrease it. We've, we've moved something that, that's worth $2,100. Uh, uh, I, I think that this is a place that I'd like to review. Councillor Hunnaby. Thank you. So uh, just uh, in response to uh, those comments, I uh, certainly would agree that we should be reconsidering those. Um, certainly in the light of the reduction and moving uh, membership fees over to legislative as opposed to local grants. I just wanted to understand with the grants, intermunicipal social services, so through the chair to Ms. Hurst, so does this include, does that item include the housing amount that we've been providing every year, something like $40,000? That does not include that. Okay, so where, where would... Is it, it's not been on supplemental? No. It's still under four, and there's been no it's change? Under four, there's been no change. Thank you. So, uh, Council, um, in, are you in agreement to flag this for further discussion? What is the total amount in the local grants that we allocate? around a hundred thousand yeah. it is it's over a hundred um in, in last year's through. budget was uh la last year's total budget was a hundred fourteen thousand dollars that had something of a carryover though so i don't believe that that's uh, that was a one shot wasn't there something about that anyways I, i'll leave that to staff but to, to give council the, the uh, general idea it's around a hundred thousand or more so if we can flag that for further discussion. Thank you. Anything further on this section, Council? Okay, we can move on. 
Uh, the next four headings uh, would fall under my jurisdiction. Uh, natural gas from Municipal Hall is uh, an estimate from our friends at Fortis for what it's going to cost to heat the building. We are still going to look for ways to cut that down, but um, we're running pretty lean as it is, so I thought it would be best that we put the money in at this time. Uh, they're placing the water heaters for both 860 Lapson and 398 Fraser. They're pretty self-explanatory. They're basically at the end of their life and they need to be replaced. The one for 398 Fraser is offset from the Eva Chafe Reserve Fund, so that is a wash. Uh, the roof on 860 Lampson is actually a late item that thanks to the windstorm we had just a week ago, um, we were trying to stretch out the replacement of that roof until next year, so we would, when we did both buildings, uh, roof replacement, we could get some economies of scale. Unfortunately, the wind uh, did not want to go along with that plan, and there's been a fair amount of damage to that roof, and having expected it, um, it needs to be replaced this year, otherwise we could face structural damage if we have a wet season. Did that wind come from Victoria? Did we charge them? Yeah. Well, I think it came from Colwood, but they don't have that money, so I don't know if help us any. You asked for the suit. For the benefit of all, which is our building at 860 Lampson? Uh, it's the one just on the corner of Lampson and Transfer Street. We own two properties in that area that were bought in anticipation of straightening out that for lack of a better term, dog like, um, so larger trucks wouldn't be able to uh, access the telephone that way. And at this time, we haven't uh, moved forward with that project yet. And do we have that house rented? And does it realize uh, revenue? It is rented, and there is a revenue stream from it. Thank you. And is that uh, a way to recover this roof repair in any way? Uh, no, not at this time. Uh, the revenue, the rent we do get from it is set at uh, a reasonable level uh, as based on the rental market um, and as the owners of the home, uh, this would be our responsibility. Absolutely. Just, just to follow up, are we at market value for that rent? Uh, last time I checked, I believe we were in the ballpark. Thank we you. might be a touch low, but not significant. Thank you. Will our appraised value go up if we put a new roof on? <laughs> Am I nickel and diming you? Please go on. That's it for my section. Safe to say, if Minister 
justice was to make a decision, we would it would be to our benefit financially. And that's understanding again is that process whereby our future is within the hands of the province, and the longer that goes, our costs are therefore in place. So I understand the need to budget for this. It's just frustrating when another level of government is driving the bus and we're just along for the ride. Not a question so much as me whining, so thank you. Recognize your frustration. <laughs> I think, though, that in all fairness, there is budgeting within here with a process that needs to occur as we go forward. Uh, and as staff have said, um, you know, it, it is dependent on the decision, uh, but we have set the direction, and in anticipation of going in that direction, it is realistic for, the, uh, for us to do that. Recognize your frustration. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. We'll move on. My first item tonight, uh, Mayor and Council, is uh, an item that's needed to support our iPad tech tablet system. And this is an alternative to our mo previous mobile data terminal. And the, uh, the advantage to the iPad is that does a much better job of supporting firefighters on the scene or during their inspections. And uh, also with this system, it's only a one-time request um, and it's not tied to Santa Fire Dispatch, which would have required a $20,000 a year payment for that, for providing that support for the mobile data terminal. So that's why it's only a one-time request and it's for the, the uh, server or that's needed for that piece of equipment. Thank you. And the next item is in regards to succession planning for exempt staff training and for exempt staff training. Oh, uh, we can't hear you, Chief. I'm just trying to talk, speak to the iPad. Uh, Dave, can you hold it just till he's gone through the section? Would you be all right with that? Sorry, sure. Councillor Hodge. That's, that's fair. Thank you, Councillor. My next item is uh, in regards to succession planning and exempt staff training. And um, with the announcement of uh, Deputy Anderson's uh, retirement this October, we are going to need to go to a system of um, a process of um, advertising for that position, whether or not we're successful from hiring from within or without. There's still going to be a cost associated with that process for advertising. And also, there'll probably be a one month salary during the mentoring process of that uh, appointment. Um, so that's a, a budget request, and it's my re also my request that we increase core by five thousand dollars because um, administrative uh, replacements an ongoing issue with staff. The next item: toil payouts. Uh, toil stands for time off in lieu of overtime, and that uh, those amounts are incurred when firefighters uh, work. Uh, in fashion other than emergency call out overtime. For instance, of training, attending um, um, certain seminars or, or um, for instance, if an a officer was to attend a, a free planning seminar or something, then they do not incur overtime, they incur toil. However, um, I've asked for an $11,000 budget request and that to be included in course, so annually rather than having a um, unfunded liability at the end of somebody's career, they're paid out for that toil that's accumulated that year and it's paid out at that rate of pay rather than carrying it forward for four or five years and paying them out when they retire at a, a larger amount. Um, the next item, FDIC, that stands for Fire Department Instructors Conference. And I'm requesting $3,000 or 2950 to send two firefighters to that. That's to cover travel and accommodation. These are two members that um, do not incur overtime. They're exempt staff. So, and exempt staff do not incur toil either. So, um, 
There will be some acting pay to cover off those officers while they are in attendance at that, that conference, but there's uh, great value in, in the FDIC conference. Um, that's where um, the members receive the instruction and the training that they can bring back to the rest of the fire fighters throughout the year. And the Unit 701 fleet cost, that's the new command vehicle, and those are the costs for um, maintenance for that vehicle for the year. Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, through the Chair. Just wanted to uh, pick up on the uh, use of the iPad tablets. And I've heard from the staff chief that they're very much impressed and, and find these uh, pieces of equipment to be extremely useful as a part of routine duties and especially during emergency situations. So uh, kudos to yourself and the staff for taking on this uh, technology and uh, making such good use of it. So. Thank you, Councillor. Further questions? Councillor Shinbai. Uh, no, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to the Fire Chief. I take it this uh, DOIL payouts is a contractual agreement? That's correct. Thank you. No further questions? Carry on, Chief. The next item under public safety building, that's for the exterior painting and ceiling of the outside of the building. Now that we have a new roof and um, some new concrete and uh, it's probably been 10 to 12 years since it's been painted and it's starting to show its age and wear. And I think it's a, a case of protecting our infra infrastructure assets. So it, it's in need of paint and ceiling. And I've had quotes on that. and. Um, I was quite surprised at how reasonable it is for, for two coats of paint for the entire building. Um, Just in clarification, Chief, uh, because that's shared with uh, police, we still uh, end up having the same cost, don't we? Yeah, they, Even though the budget would be shared with police. They share O&M operation and maintenance costs, but they don't share uh, improvement costs with the building. All right. And the other thing, Mayor, for the record, uh, that's cost recovery, and I never seem to see that either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next item, emergency program. Um, three years ago, before Squamalt established an emergency program of their own, there was $10,000 that was paid to the City of Victoria. So at the onset of that program, um, the director of the ESS program receives a stipend um, which is half of that amount, and certainly the, our emergency program has made great strides. But um, at the recommendation of our emergency program manager, and with the growth of the programs, they are suggesting that, um, that a, a small stipend be paid to the amateur radio director and deputy director, the amateur um, a small amount of $360 for a volunteer appreciation night, and, and finally, the ESS deputy director amount of $1,500. And if you work that out uh, at an hourly rate, it probably would be less than what a counselor makes per hour. Five sure cents an hour. I'm not sure that's possible. Our hourly rate sucks. <laughs> and any questions? Any questions on that? Thank you. Worth every penny. Thank you. I don't know who speaks to the police budget, but it looks like it's... Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that. So it's the $389,000 is, is the amount that we talked about earlier that's been adjusted for the two sworn officers that we don't pay for and the disagreement in the um, assessed value for the funding formula. Thank you. Now, okay, let's start with Councillor Brown. Okay. Say we lose our battle and we have to pay the full buck. Um, those extra officers and the change in the percentage that they keep swearing that supposed to be 15, 16% rather than the you know, lower percent that we were uh, we agreed on in the beginning. Say we, we lose the battle and we have to pay all that, so therefore we did not budget for that, where would that money come from at the end of the day? The sworn officers has already been a decision by the Solicitor General that won't, that, that gone through the appeal process. Won't, they won't come back on us for that. Um, I actually, we have a letter on file that they, 
they put us on notice that they will sue us for the other portion, and we'll talk about that later. Council Morrison. And back to my earlier points on how contingency funds can be our best friend, and this is probably a primary example of where I is that what's wrong on that? That we would. No, we, this is a, a, a subject we should not discuss at this meeting. Okay. Right. Sure. No, that's okay. okay. But we. Staff. But to answer, the general contingency yeah. fund is not where we pay for these funds from. But we can have that discussion later about okay. where we would pay for those funds. In terms of having that discussion, is is there an in camera session set aside for that at some point, or because that's what I believe we need to do. Or, should, or, or is this the time to address that and call in and now go in camera? You can go in camera tonight. You can go in camera at the end of the discussions tomorrow or at the beginning of the discussions. We didn't schedule an in-camera meeting, but all it takes is a unanimous vote of council to do that. And generally, when we're having these budget meetings, if we feel the need to go in camera, we just ask council to vote on it. And we can do it at the moment. So you can do it at the end of tonight. You can do it at the beginning of tomorrow or at the end of tomorrow. It's totally up. We can flag that for, for a discussion. Okay, I, I would like that flagged so that we have that discussion at the end of the night and we won't inconvenience the public at this point. Uh, there are certainly discussions uh, that I'd like to have more around the police budget. The, the request for increased costs around <coughs> the day, uh, although I recognize and understand the need, um, the difficulty always is, is that the celebrations are determined and decided by Victoria. This is their sesquicentennial, and I don't know that we have looked into what extra will that cost and add to our the policing cost. And is it fair in the region that Esquimalt shares in the cost and not necessarily uh, the benefit, albeit Regionally, we all share in a benefit of having a celebration on Canada Day. That means everybody. So there, therein lies the difficulty and the discussion. And I certainly um, um, would um, look to the, the rest of council for some discussion around that. Uh, I will let you know that um, there was, uh, in last year's budget, uh, actually ended up with a, an amount, an extra amount in the police budget. Dave, I believe you were there for that discussion. Uh, sorry, Councillor Hodgins. Um, you look just friendly and I, I'm referring to you as Dave tonight. Um, and uh, that money went into a long needed uh, fund, but that being said, it was a, a substantial amount of money that went into that fund that um, could have, uh, you know, reduced our overall cost last year had we had that sense. So I, I think there's room to wiggle. Any further discussion on that? So we will highlight that, and I know that there's a section on that, is there? Yes, and I just, I just wanted to clarify that the reason that we have to go in camera because there is pending litigation on that issue, so we should discuss it in camera. Thank you. Perhaps we should implement uh, robocalls and have all the people <laughs> from downtown be funneled to uh, to Traffic counts. Uh, the last traffic count we carried out in Esquimalt was in 2007. 
uh, has been a victim of uh, budget cuts in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm bringing it back again. Uh, the reason we look at 28 locations within the municipality on our major and our collector roads, and this would give us an indication of what the traffic use uh, that we would see on those roads. Uh, the road condition evaluation, um, this is a program I'm looking to institute. It's basically at this point on a five year cycle. And what would happen is we would go and contract out and hopefully there's been some talk in the region as well as other municipalities doing this at the same time. But through the use of specialized equipment, uh, we would get a snapshot of what our road conditions are like. So on a scale of one to 10, uh, 10 being best, one being the worst, we would get a range of what our roads look like. This would allow us to kind of plan which roads should get some preventive maintenance as to oppose the ones that are down at one or two that are probably at the rebuild stage. Uh, the library for engineering reports. Currently our reports are scattered throughout cubicles and offices. Uh, the idea is to centralize it so we have that history. So, uh, as we're seeing through changes in staff, um, if it was sitting in someone's office and they didn't know about it, two years later we find this report that we weren't sure had happened or not, but does contain valuable information. So that would centralize all those engineering reports and history. Uh, storage for plans, uh, believe it or not, there is a lot of development within Esquimalt. And each one of those has an as-built plan signed off by an engineer. Uh, we take an electronic copy, but we also take a paper copy with the engineer's seal on it as well, and that is our backup copy if we have problems um, with the electronic one. The traffic study for bike lanes on Lamson is a similar exercise to what was carried out last year on Admirals. It would look at the right-of-way we have and determine on a preliminary stage whether or not we could uh, incorporate bike lanes into that right away and what would be the impacts uh, and give us a rough cost estimate for doing that. That would also give us another north-south corridor that would have a bike lane connecting the ENN plus the Squamal Road plus Craig Floor. Uh, the road study for Lyle Street, again, this is again looking at the right away. Um, if you look at Lyle Street, there is the remnants of an old bike lane on the sidewalk, which some people interpret as a parking space. Uh, this would be, again, to look at that right away. To, could we incorporate bike lanes? What would it do to parking? What would it do to pedestrian traffic? So we would come with a preliminary cross-section and a cost to how that would relate. Thank you. Questions, Council? Uh, Councillor Brain and then Council Councillor Morrison. Um, two comments and a question. Um, going to shared services, we know the military just did basically a traffic study of the area. How friendly would they be, do you think, to sharing some of that? I mean, they were at some of the key intersections of our community. Um, how much do you think they're willing to share? They would probably be willing to share quite a bit. The caution with that is they were not looking at what our needs are, they are looking at their needs. So they would probably have just looked at Admirals, um, the Squamo Road, just how they enter and exit out of the base. Well, they went all the way out. They were out at Tillicum and Gorge and, and uh, that might You might be thinking of the CRD did a major transportation one as well. We would gather that information as well. Uh, but the caution there again is with the CRD looking at it, they were looking only at major transportation corridors. So places like Lyle, um, some, some on Lampson and Head were not captured in their study, but we would ask for that information when we're carrying out ours. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and glad to see that the Lyle Street's in there. I know in just the three years, this is, I guess this is what, the fourth budget, this has been on almost every year and it's, I think it's, it's time has come. I know we procrastinated for a variety of reasons, but I'm not sure we can stall on looking at this road too much longer. 
My one fear with taking out, and, and if it's okay, I wouldn't mind flagging the road condition evaluation of every five years to come back to it when we're looking at where we can mix and mingle, just because that's a major part of our infrastructure, and evaluating where our roads are at to me is really important. So I wouldn't mind flagging that to come back to in the midst of what can we take out and what can we leave in. Thank you. Councillor Morrison. Um, so just to, and to expand on that, just to clarify, with the, the road condition evaluation every five years, is that is that just structure of the road, or does that also include uh, aesthetics, lighting, pedestrian safety, like sort of the above the ground uh, aspects of, or the more social aspects of, of the road conditions as opposed to the engineering structure? No. That's no. Just, it's just structure. No, the road condition survey would look at the road structure itself. Okay. Uh, we are starting to implement asset management plans that will look at lighting our, our sidewalks and such. So there was, while that would be something we are looking at, it would not be part of the road conditions uh, study. That's strictly the, uh, the road structure itself, the asphalt, the gravel, the stuff you drive on. So for that $50,000 we just get? Just the road. Just the road. Okay. Um, and, and also, go back to the, uh, the Lyle Street, just to clarify, so that would be a study as to whether we could have bike lanes uh, as opposed to people parking where there's, or have the bike lane restored instead of having people parking on the bike lanes, is that, is that correct? That would be part of it. Uh, there has been some concern to what that road, that right away cross section looks like. Uh, this study would try to come up with a finite appearance to what that would look like and again would tell us is there enough right away there to incorporate bike lanes plus on street parking plus a sidewalk it might come back and say no you can't have a bike lane and still maintain but that's what the study will uh, hopefully turn to tell us and just refresh my memory I think this predates both of us um, but when was the decision made to put the biking lanes on Squimal Road, like one block basically north of Lyle Street, the, the extended biking lanes to go along Squimal Road? How long have they been? No. Uh, I really can't give you an okay. answer. I think when Squimal Road was upgraded, it was always part of the plan to add biking lanes onto it. Uh, but I can't say with any degree of certainty when the decision was made to do that. That predates myself. And I'm, I'm guessing at that time the, the vision there was that bikes would use Esquimalt Road along with cars, the main thoroughfare, and, and as a result, bikes were not so encouraged to use Lyle Street. And that's why we're in the state we're in. Is that? I Councilor Morrison. I cannot uh, answer that. Councilor Hundleby was there. Okay, and so I'll just flag that item. And so I'll ask her if she wants to respond. Um, in answer to uh, Councilor Morrison's um, question, I believe it happened just before I came on council the first time, so that would be in the late 90s. So between 96 and 99, uh, it happened at that point. My guess is around 97. Yeah. So, uh, so it's, it's been around for that long. Uh, so I'll just to be clear, I'll, I'll flag that file. Councillor Shinlein. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, through you to staff. Um, on the five-year, uh, excuse me, on the five-year uh, road condition report, when was the last time that was done? I believe the last one we did, we did one in 1995, and the last one I know of is in 2006. Uh, right, and my second question is, I'm trying to, understand this. Um, so a road condition report says, okay, this is the shape of the asphalt, this is the shape of the, the gravel underneath, this is the, the shape of, you know, if the road's dipping and, you know, you need some underground work done. But when we start looking at things like traffic study for bike lanes and uh, the Lyle Street, I, I'm not getting into the data about the necessity of it. My question is, should the road study be done first before you start looking at things like whether we're going to expand it, put in a bike lane, or we're going to do whatever. Uh, would it 
be more cost effective for us to have a better understanding of what our road bed network is like, what the, the stuff underneath the, the asphalt is like, before we start digging it up, suddenly have surprises, and then suddenly a, a bike lane project costs twice as much as maybe it should have. So I'm wondering, uh, in terms of uh, setting a priority, maybe we need to flag this so that we can get some more information as to which is a priority, unless, of course, you can answer that right now. I can give you a general idea. Fair um, enough. You have to remember most bike lanes will fit within the right of way in the road structure that's already there. Um, we try, the intent probably would not be to try to expand the asphalt surface. It would be the asphalt surface we have now. Is it sufficient to support bike lanes? So really putting a bike lane is just painting a line down the road. The asphalt structure wouldn't change other than the loading that goes on top of it. Uh, the purpose for the road evaluation study is to determine which roads you can, uh, through preventive maintenance, whether it be crack sealing, micro paving, or such, if you do a treatment at an early point in its life or at the appropriate point in its life, you would get 10 or 15 more years, depending on what the treatment is, before you start going to a point where the road deteriorates and you go into a rebuild situation. Uh, once a road has reached a certain point, uh, and I'll use an example of, of Fairview in the industrial area, if you go down that section of road where it comes into Devonshire, uh, the entire road surface is cracked, um, water is going into the base, the base is probably non-existent uh, for doing the structural purpose it was there for. To go and now say let's overlay that road um, would probably be a fair waste of money because there is no structure underneath it. Uh, within five years, you would probably see that new asphalt cracking up. So the, this study will help identify those roads and help us set priorities where we go and say, uh, maybe on a road like Lampson, all it needs is another 25 millimeters on it as a wearing surface and that will get us another 10 years or 20 years out of it. And then we know roads like Fairview that we'll have to budget for the rebuild of it. So what we're trying to do is stave off getting into that rebuild stage as much as possible. There's a famous curve in all engineering texts where at one point if you do something, it goes up almost to the same life expectancy as new and you gain that amount. And if you hit that point every time, you should never get into a point where you're having to rebuild a road or rebuild <coughs> that structure. And that's what we're gonna to try to achieve with our asset management plans. And this is a tool in which to come to that realization where that point is. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. That's why I was sort of, because I noticed it was uh, uh, on the acts list. And uh, I think that's why I said, uh, flag that because it's fifty thousand dollars for that study, thirty thousand dollars for the bike lane study. Maybe there's something we can do. You know, maybe a little again, a little more discussion on the priority. But again, you know, I'm kind of leaning that I kind of like to know what the road shape are in before I worry about whether we extend our bike system. So that's that's my concern. Thank you. I guess I would have to do that. Flag lamps and and, and flag the uh, traffic or excuse me, the traffic evaluation. Okay, so just to so that they can be discussed at the same time, Your Worship. Thank you. So just to be clear, we've got uh, road condition flag, traffic study for bike lanes on lamps and flag, and somebody flag road study for Lyle Street. Yeah. Yep. Everybody's okay with that. Are there further uh, questions? Um, I have a couple of questions and comments, um, and it relates to the same three items. Um, I see the road condition evaluation as a, a proactive move to uh, dealing with infrastructure before it gets to, uh, to crisis stage, which costs far more than, it, uh, as you've eloquently explained, if we can hit it at that right point in the curve, we can buy a lot more time and, and use of it. Uh, for lower cost. The 
uh, traffic study for bike lanes on lamps, and I'm absolutely committed to uh, improving our cycling network. But when I uh, talk to cyclists, um, and they talk about um, what are barriers to cycling, clearly Lamson Street is a significant hill. And I'm wondering whether, realistically, as much as it's a great east-west route, whether that is being realistic uh, with our dollars of 30,000. You know, how many bikes actually use it? Have we done a bike count on that road? Have we done any measurement that suggests that that is a route that we should be looking at? Um, and so I agree with the flagging for, for that reason. I don't know what the other route is, because I know that Admirals has the same questions uh, and concerns, but um, uh, I, I think we have to be realistic with bike lanes, even though we want to get the east-west, how many cyclists actually use that hill? Uh, and I can think of a better place for 30,000 right now without that information in front of me. The road study for Lyle Street, uh, we did one a few years ago, um, 2005, 2006, and it was, uh, it, it, it studied bicycle lanes, uh, the width of the road. Uh, it, it really was, uh, as I remember, and that could, you know, could very well be uh, quite foggy, but um, we did, we did really uh, look at, at that road and at the end of the day we ended up putting it on a shelf and I don't think it's so dated that it couldn't be pulled off the shelf uh, to be at least reviewed. Uh, we ended up with a number of very contentious issues as you can imagine. Parking being one of them. We were going to remove the, the bicycle lane as I remember. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, it became a part of the discussion around the broader picture of village project and all of the municipal lands. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that when we deferred that because of those contentious issues potentially, as well as the idea of still looking at it with the development or changes that we might incur around our uh, bigger picture, longer term village project in terms of the parking lots of Archie Browning and those sorts of things. Um, is it of value to take a look at this old study uh, first and also then also at some point sort of review it within the greater context of the uh, uh, initial visioning of our municipal lands and how it ties in? So I, I again agree with the flagging because of those reasons. Councillor Hundley. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd also uh, agree with that. Um, in addition to the issues on Lyle Street, there was the issues that we no longer have of heavy oil trucks going down the street. So I think that it bears looking at, um, and we may want to update it. Uh, one of the things around traffic studies is that things do change, and so sometimes we do need to relook at things in a new context. So I would be in favor of relooking at that. And certainly I know that there are some um, residents who are would be in favor of that. Thank you. And I guess one final point that just came to my mind was, and still is, the um, unfinished business of the sewage treatment plant and use of our roads and how mitigation may uh, at the end of the day be a part of that process and I know that that was part of why we deferred some of these discussions. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hanover. Thank you. Hanover. Thank you. Um, and so I, I firmly believe that it would be uh, not in our best interest to defer the road condition evaluation. I think that if we are going to look at mitigation and compensation for um, the use of our roads because of heavy cement trucks or, I don't want to say sewage, but uh, heavy cement trucks anyways, 
uh, we need to have a baseline in which to measure it with. And so it would be important for us to have that knowledge, because if we don't have it, then I don't know that we can actually ask for mitigation and compensation. For me, I think it's, it's important and it should not be. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have them flagged for further discussion. Okay, our next heading is roadway structures with two items underneath it. Uh, the first one is basically our construction materials. Uh, it does say asphalt, but it includes a wide range of construction materials, gravel, sand, everything that goes into building a road. Uh, in 2010, that budget was reduced uh, down to a bare minimum. Basically, it was fixing potholes and not much more than that. In the 2011 budget, uh, council increased it by half, which was $17,000, and we would look at uh, increasing it again back up to the 2009 level with another $17,000. Uh, the next one is, as we put more lines on our roads, so the bike lanes on Craig Flower and on Esquimalt Road, uh, and essentially because of the islands and such, you start to double your center lines. We are put, when we go to paint our road markings, we are increasing our total kilometers, and so that's reflected in that $4,000 cost. Uh, the sidewalks, the concrete, as again for the construction materials, it was in the similar situation as the asphalt materials, <coughs> halved in uh, or taken down to a bare minimum in 2010, and we're trying to get it back up to 2009 levels. Uh, the traffic lights and signs, the sign inventory, we do carry a certain number of signs within our inventory. Uh, the more common ones. These ones would be the less common ones. So what happens now when a traffic order is issued or we need a new sign that is not one of our common ones, we then have to order it and that can take two to five weeks depending on what the sign is and where we can get it from in order to get it back onto the street. So by it, the 5,000 we would increase that inventory and that would increase our response time. Uh, the janitorial service, that was a contract that was let last year and on a three year term and obviously the cost went up and that's reflective in the new core budget. And I think I'll stop there before I go into environmental. Thank you. Councillor Hanabi. Um, thank you, through you to Mr. Miller. So regarding the uh, janitorial contract, it's a three year term. So does this amount of does the amount of money go up each year within that term, or is that will that be the same value for the next three years? Uh, there will be some variation in it. It won't be a significant variation. Uh, the contract is written that uh, the contractor is to meet QP wages for an equivalent position. Uh, we do negotiate with them uh, to what it is, uh, to what the increase is going to be, and we try to match that due to that clause in each collective agreement. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shinba. Oh. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, want to go to sidewalks? Um, so if I understand what you've explained to me, and I'm off, that's fair, let me know. Uh, the $6,500 that you're asking is an increase on the $6,500 that's already there, so it actually brings it up to thirteen k. Uh, no, actually, I, I don't have the number in the top of my head, but I believe it's in the total budget then would be $60,000. Thank you. That's the answer. Further questions? Okay, Councillor Hanlon. Okay, environmental services. Uh, Council Hunby had asked uh, how our sewers were doing. Um, I guess I maybe didn't answer that question fully because I do have a request for an additional $7,000. What we have been noticing in our gravity sewers, which are our sanitary sewers, uh, increased number of breaks in a number of locations where they probably weren't relined. Uh, this is to deal with those breaks that we're seeing in increased frequency. With luck, um, I probably won't need it, 
But having said that, I'm sure I'll have a break tomorrow that is going to be rather costly. Mm -hmm. The uh, H-Frame, uh, we have 11 lift stations within the uh, township. Uh, in order to access those, those are defined as confined space. This uh, piece, of, this apparatus would allow us to access any one of those. Uh, it would be mobile, so we could go from point to point and do it. It would also be usable because um, manholes are also confined, defined as uh, confined space, uh, active ones. So we would also be able to use this as a confined space uh, egress system as well for our manholes. Thank you. Councillor Hanley. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you to Mr. Miller. So is the request for the H frame then, is that also recommended by WCB? It is a uh, safety concern. Uh, at this point, we cannot enter our lift stations um, to do maintenance if necessary. Uh, basically, at this point, uh, there's a number of ways you can do it, but at this point, what happens is we take our crane truck down and hook our, our uh, technician or public works individual onto the end of the crane and we lower them into the uh, such. Uh, it's rather an expensive use for a crane truck that can be used in other applications. This, like I said, would allow us to go to all of our lift stations, plus when we do have a problem at a manhole, we would have a proper system in order to uh, allow our people to safely enter and exit a combined space. Thank you, it's pretty clear to me. Councilman Pye. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Bradley Sewer Construction, I know you've been working on relining for uh, a number of years. How far are we along? We got uh, two thirds done, have we got half of it done? We have approximately half of it done and that's as far as we've gone. That was the sewer grant money, money that uh, I believe was first allocated in 2000. At that time, a survey or they cameraed the entire system, rated it from one to five. The one, twos, and threes, I believe all the ones and twos, which is the structural condition of the pipe, were relined and a portion of the threes, but I can't tell you how much. And that either got us well, approximately 45% of our system or just under 50. The remainder of the system, again, we haven't cameraed it since, so we really don't know what shape it's in at this time. Thank you. Move to that. Is the remainder of the system our uh, portion of the system, or is it from our pipe to the to the house? I'm, I'm probably mixing and matching I and I, but I'm. The main lines are ours, as well as the services that come off the main lines to the property line are ours. Once you cross the property line to the house, they are the responsibility of the homeowner. Okay, thank you. Um, just for council's information, this becomes very important uh, in terms of inflow and infiltration, which is what I and I is. I'm not going to answer all the questions around that, other than the understanding is that broken pipes, et cetera, or uh, uh, poor infrastructure allows more flow. And based on uh, costs in the future for sewage treatment, they will be based on flow is what we're understanding. More flow means more cost. So in the past, council has really um, encouraged and tried to emphasize uh, the need to, to ensure that our infrastructure is at the best possible state. Uh, and so councils previously uh, have uh, done, uh, put monies aside and borrowed monies to uh, help the, the greater pipes by doing the new lining. Um, but there's still that um, next section and our, our flows can continue to be third highest or second highest in the region. And that's because we're old. So I just wanted to add that little anecdote. Thank you. And the last one on the sheet, and the last one for me, is the recycling charge for the yard and garden uh, 
drop-off depot. Again, that was a contract that was released last year and awarded. Uh, again, this is the change in the cost that we uh, have seen. Councillor McCann. Uh, have you looked at, um, you talked about the canteen room? Uh, yes. One. Have we looked at looking after that ourselves, Con instead of contracting it out? Is it viable? Uh, prior to this contract, we did not really have any information with respect to how much tonnage uh, is being used, who uses it, uh, how many commercial people are using it. In this contract, we included that requirement um, to get that information. So we could make a decision to whether or not that's something that should come in house. Uh, the one caution that goes along with it is we can operate the site. We will probably still have to contract with someone to dispose of it because obviously we don't have the land area. But tied into that as well would be what direction the CRD is going with household organics and with yard waste as well. Sometimes yard waste is used to cut the household organics when they're making uh, compost and such. So the, the awarding of it uh, to a private contractor for the, I believe it was a five year term or three, I can't remember off the bat, kind of coincides when a lot of things are probably going to come to fruition with respect to heartland and such. So with the information we're gathering at this time, we can then make an informed decision as to whether or not it would be to our advantage to bring that in-house or not. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Shane uh, Following along the same line. So, when I understand this program, very simply put, is that basically this is a place where we collect organic waste that sits there and then is disposed of? The yard and garden waste uh, drop-off site or program only deals with yard and garden waste. It does not deal with household organics. So this is the grass, the leaves, uh, trees up until three inches, three feet long. Um, okay. And that is a program, users who can use that site are View Royal and Esquimo residents. We get cost recovery from View Royal for them participating in that. I just had one of those mental moments there. And I now understand the difference. But I guess, so basically we're uh, funding this, but we really, other than some of the cost recovery you said you get, we get from uh, View Royal, so we're really, this is not a revenue generator, this is an expense. Yes, we, we, so we don't generate any revenue selling this stuff off, it just piles up there, we pay money to have it piled up there and then... My understanding was, and again this predates myself, uh, at some point in the history of Esquimalt, the residents had come forward saying we need to have something to do with our yard and garden waste. Uh, the council of the day at the time said, no problem, uh, are you willing to pay for it in your taxes? The answer was yes, and this program was set up. That answered my question, thank you very much. Do I see a flag? I think so. <laughs> Any further discussion or question? Um, and, and so I wanna ask that in all seriousness, would you like to flag this item for further discussion? I think so, Your Worship, because uh, Although I, I'm pretty sure it, 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 it probably does accomplish something, but I'm just concerned that, uh, and from previous experience, that when municipalities start getting into this, usually there's some sort of cost recovery that, that we could work on. And I, I might be showing my ignorance on the process, but I don't know. I, I just thought that might be something we should be talking about. It is still an expense to municipality. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to Councillor Brame. She may be adding something from Sweet CRG. Sure. Well, I actually, no, but I'm going to add that um, through you to staff as a contract, we're obligated to do this for the next yeah. five years, anyways. We can't really take it out or flag. We can flag it, but we can't do anything about it as we sign a legal contract. Uh, thank you. Uh, given that, I, I would be willing to say that if we don't flag it, 
And I think this is maybe something we should talk about later. And I would be prepared to take the flagging off of it, providing that at some point council addresses this. I, I think uh, that... Because we do have time for the contract to expire. Yes, and, and the region is in a state of flux as to what to do with um, kitchen scraps. And, and that's why I kind of nodded at you when you said, are trees not or organic? Because the organics are considered the kitchen scraps. Uh, right now, and and so what you know, what are municipalities doing? Everyone, every municipality is doing something differently right now. CRD was hoping to coordinate it. Um, that, in fact, it seems to be falling apart. Uh, but we have not yet made decisions at CRD, and I'm the chair of the environmental uh, committee, and so I can certainly. Um, ask uh, CRD staff to come and uh, I can provide you with some background information that might help us as we go forward on this issue. Uh, fair enough, Your Worship, and I, just as a side note, I have read some of it. But uh, I, again, I'm looking at this strictly from a financial viewpoint. Understand. Yeah. Councillor Hodgins. Through the chair, then, in terms of, I understand the contract part of this, but there is also an opportunity for a discussion around user fees. So in the flag part, we can have that conversation. I'm not suggesting I support an additional user fee in this particular area, but it's maybe worth a conversation. With respect to charging a fee to it, um, it would depend on what context you're speaking of um, and where we could fit it into the contract and how we collect it, I guess. When you look at it right now, there is, I guess, technically a user fee on the residents already in the fact that it's part of their taxation and therefore they're free to use it. Um, with respect to commercial haulers, uh, we might be able to no negotiate that with the, the uh, current operator. But again, part of our problem has been, and we evaluate, looked at it when, when we were going out for a contract at this time, is we don't know how much is that site being used. If you remember in the period reports, there's a new item that comes in that tells you the number of users from View Royal and Esquimalt, the tonnage hauled off, and tonnage that we think has come from commercial. And that is the information we need in order to determine um, whether or not this is something to take on. Again, it won't be a cost neutral uh, enterprise because we don't have the land mass or the equipment in order to do our own compost. And unfortunately for us as well, the volumes we do generate uh, probably would not be significant um, where someone would want to buy it off of us, let's put it that way. But again, that's where we need this information. So this would be probably a discussion that would be more appropriate as we're going in to the last year of the contract to make the decision whether or not this is something we want to continue on with. Again, as Her Worship has said, uh, the CRD as a whole is in a flux as to what is going to go on. There are a number of possibilities that, uh, depending on which way it goes, this material is something that can be used to generate methane. If uh, a waste to energy plant is in the future at Heartland or someplace else. This would be another energy stream that could be used to assist in the operation of that plant as well as reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, again, we're such at the early stages, uh, it's hard to, I guess, give you an answer at this point. Uh, my recommendation at this point would be give us a year or so to see where this contract is going and what type of tonnages are going and where is the CRD as a whole going, I think at that time I would be better suited to uh, give you an answer 
as to whether this is a profitable venture for us to venture into. Councilor Brandon. Just touching on uh, what Mr. Miller said, it, this is such a new contract. I think we only came, it only changed over in September or October. Uh, fall of last year. Yeah, so we haven't even had it a year yet to get a full year's numbers worth of information. So I think um, definitely at least waiting a year before we see what exactly we thought before we make any further decision. And, and I just want to make sure, you know, we can't, it's hard to take it out of the budget because of the whole yeah. health issue as well. We don't, you know, right now, you know, it, some of it, you know, is covered by health. We take it out and make sure it's not needed by the military and then we're paying 100%. Um, I just want to add that there's um, a number of exciting options as we go forward, and I, I uh, thank Councillor Hodgins for speaking to them. Waste energy is is huge, and there seem to be all sizes of uh, abilities out there, um, uh, although th it has to be viable, and so that's my understanding from uh, uh, Mr. Miller, is that are, are we viable? Along with that, though, since we partner with the Royal, is there an opportunity to partner with View Royal when it comes to kitchen scraps? We won't know that until we know what CRD is doing. Um, uh, along with that idea, um, certainly um, Dockside doesn't have the volume they need. Is there an opportunity there? So there are a number of things that as we go down this route and CRD uh, tends to give better direction as to where they're headed, we have <coughs> opportunities uh, that that could present themselves as uh, a better use of our funds and, and perhaps even some revenue generation. I'm always hopeful. Thank you. Is there anything further under environmental developmental services? Services is next, and there's just three items, so I'll speak to each of those. The request for staff for educational assistance is uh, a senior planner who's entered into um, an education program for which he signed a contract with the municipality. We uh, share costs uh, of that, of him attending that education uh, forum, and he has agreed that if he leaves within a certain length of time, he will pay that back. So that's uh, to do with that agreement. Um, I can't speak a lot to the Culture Advisory Committee request for $750. I don't know if someone else maybe. Um, if there are any questions, I can steal that. Okay. Um, and then the Community Tourism reprint of our walking tour brochures, which we all know are very popular and we need some more of them. So I think that one's self-explanatory. So as Bill said, if you have any questions on the Culture Advisory Committee, Questions, Council? I noticed the ferry is out of our brochures. <laughs> we need to reprint more. <laughs> um, the next section is, is Centennial Celebration. That was an early approval, so I don't think we need to go through that one. That's just uh, the cost with the offsetting revenue that are in the budget. Thank you. What I'd like to do is take a five minute recess.